Okay, Romans 3. So we're going to spend time again this week in verses 10 through 18. Last time, if you remember, we looked at, did we start out, the first thing we looked at was the way Paul dealt with his enemies. That there were some people, if you look at verse 8 here in Romans 3, the people, and not rather, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. Uh, there were some people stating that Paul was saying, well, hey, we should do evil so good can come. Um, and we spent quite a bit of time talking about he didn't engage those people. He just said, hey, their damnation is just. We went and looked at all those verses talking about, he under, Paul understood it was Paul's job to preach the gospel. It was God's job to take the vengeance. And it was God's job to deal with, with the naysay, naysayers, the people attacking and defame, defaming him. If Paul had responded in hate, if he had personally taken vengeance, he would have been given an occasion for his enemies to blaspheme the word of God because he would not have been living what he specifically was preaching. Um, it's called Paul's gospel, right? The gospel, if he wasn't a living up to it, people could have said, well, it's not even working on the guy preaching it. They could have said he preaches grace, but he's not graceful. Um, not living according to the grace of God, not living according to who you are in Christ does, in fact, give the world opportunity to blaspheme the word of God. It's interesting. We're looking at this kind of in both of our studies right now, Romans and Ephesians. Um, the world's going to blaspheme the word of God. Don't let it be on account of us. The, you know, they won't be able to legitimately do it, um, but we will. We'll talk. You know, we, we saw that happen to Natalie last week, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But um, make sure that you're, you're living what you're preaching. Not, you know, I, I don't get real caught up in this whole thing of it being a hypocrite because I think most people are hypocrites. It's just kind of the way we live our lives. Um, you know, when I was smoked, I would tell people not to smoke. It didn't mean the message wasn't right. It was kind of silly for it to be saying, but the message was still good. I think everybody does one thing and says another in some part of their life. But when you're talking about the Word of God and you say the Word of God says this and this is what I do and then you so obviously willfully do not, boy, that's an issue. That really is. And it, it hurts your own um, ability to be an ambassador. So in verses 10 through 12 here, we're going to look at this from a few different... Last week we looked at 10 through or ten through 18. And uh, we kind of looked at that issue of, we, we, you know, we went and looked at Jesus being on the cross. And every the 14 things listed here, we, we saw the, the whip, if you will, coming down on Jesus for us. Um, I, I picked that up from John Versagan, and it, it left quite an impression on me, obviously. And I think it's very powerful. Every time I read these verses, I think about that, and it gets very personal. Because when you get puffed up, oh yeah, I don't do this. Well, yeah, we all do this. So, but as you as we look at these in verses ten, well, let's just read down to eighteen. Verse ten. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So, if you look at verses 10 through 12 here, you see the person's character. You see the inner man. You see the darkness of the lost. No one's righteous. No one understands. None seek after God. They're all gone out of the way. They're all become unprofitable. And he sums it up again. There's none that doeth good. Now you pick it up in verse 13 to 18, and you see a conduct issue come up, happen. Their throats have an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of ass is under their lips. Mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery. Way of peace. No fear. The, the passage is speaking specifically, of course, to the unsaved and why all men need a Savior. But the issues of our inner man are true even for those of us that are saved. The things that our body does are just the outworking, just the physical manifestation of what's going on inside of us. If you think on things that are worldly, if you think on the works of the flesh, the works of the darkness, you're going to live that stuff out. That's what's going to come out of you. If you think that on things that are godly, if you think on things that are righteous, that the fruits of the Spirit will be produced in your body 
and you're in you and your body will do things in accord with that look over at galatians 5 galatians 5 and verse 16 when you try to do the things of dark, when you try to walk in the works of the flesh, this is what you, this is what you produce. 19, uh, Galatians 5, 19. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that say which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So if you're thinking in the way of the world, if you're living in the way of the world, if you are desiring the things of the world, these are going to be the things that you produce. And, you know, some of those, you're like, oh, I, I wouldn't do those, some of those things. Well, idolatry is simply covetousness. Fornication, adultery. Jesus said, if you do it in your heart, you've done it. So there's something there for everybody. There's something there absolutely for everybody. But you look at verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit, so this is what the, the, the Spirit will produce in you if you walk after the Spirit, if you think on things that are godly, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Verse 24 is so important though. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. If we are Christ, and if we're saved, we are, then let's, and we live in the Spirit, then let's walk after the Spirit. Let's not walk like Romans 10 through 18. Let's put on display the gospel of Christ. Let's live like we're supposed to live. Look back at Mark 7. Mark 7 and verse 18. This is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. And he saith unto them, Are ye so without understanding also? Do ye not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him, because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the draught, purging all meats? And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murderers, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. Isn't it amazing how similar that list is to the list we just read that Paul gave us? That's what's, that, that's what's, if you're thinking on the things of the world, if you're acting like the world, these are the things that are going to come out of you. What comes out of the man uh, comes out of the heart defiles a man. Come back to Romans, t- uh, Romans three, and you see you see that progression of evil in these verses here. In, in verses ten through fourteen, you you see really where it starts. It starts in the heart. Ten, eleven, and twelve. These 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 are heart issues. And then you get to thirteen. Now it's it, it, no longer are you thinking about it. Now we're going to start putting it into action. Your throat's an up open sepulcher. Your, um, hello, your tongues have used deceit. Now we're going to go in a minute. We're going to go look at all the quotes for these, and you're going to see the Old Testament, what it says about some of these passages, and it can be very enlightening. But their tongues, they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. So it goes from your heart to your mouth. You're espousing these things. And then... All the way to the point where your whole mouth is just full of nothing but cursing and bitterness. There's no good thing coming out of your mouth right now. But that's not enough. Then it becomes something you act on. Your feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in your way. You do not know the way of peace, and you have no fear of God. Starts with the evilness inside, moves to your mouth, and then it goes to your actions. Now, again, the specific context here is the unsaved, but it is true for us too. We walk, we're not going to go to hell, 
but the same things. If we are having, if we are meditating and spending our time thinking about evil things, evil things are going to come out of this. It, we like to think we, it's not going to, but it is going to. You can't be, and it, and it will be, it will spread like a cancer. You, you, if you're thinking about it in one part of your life, it'll move into all the parts of your life. Because what you start to do, you start to rationalize and justify your own behavior here, and then over here, and then over here, and then over here. And now you're using your own worldly judgments and replacing Christ as the head. They said down in verse 15, it's always reached, it's reached all the way to your feet, and that's where you're out, you're out doing these things now. What comes out of a man defiles him. So if you look over at Romans 7 and verse 18, you kind of get a feel now for Romans 7. Why was it not possible for Paul, as he goes through here, to perform the good? For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. And the whole reason for that is if you're looking inside to perform to please God, you're looking at it in an issue of idolatry and, and making the cross of Christ no effect because in you is, are, are no good, is no, bah. in you is no good thing. It's the Holy Spirit in you where the fruits of the Spirit come from. It's not from some force of will and being this great person to do it. There is no good thing in your flesh. The goodness is found in walking in the Spirit and your mind being transformed and your inner man being strengthened by the Spirit. It's so amazing to me how often you look at the Bible and it will give you the natural progression of how things happen. Even this, like we're looking at here in Romans 3, it starts in the heart, moves to the mouth, and then it moves to your actions. And I mean, there have been millions of books written about that. Get your heart right and you'll be fine. Well, you know what? The God, the, 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 if I can say it this way, the guy that created humanity, he knows how it works. And he tells you that. And he also gives you the answer. Okay, so let's not dwell on the things of the flesh. Let's not walk after the flesh. Let's dwell on the things of the spirit. Let's walk after the spirit. So what I thought we'd do, because I really enjoy doing this, is the, all these things that he, Paul lists here in 10 to 18 are all quotes. We talked about that last time. Paul uses the Old Testament scriptures, Jewish scriptures, to prove to the Jew that they're not righteous as well. So we'll go back, and I want to look at them. It'll take a little bit of time, but not a huge amount of time, because a lot of them are lumped together. And we'll read probably a couple verses before and a couple verses after on some of them. And you kind of get a feel for when Paul says these things to the Jew who should have understood their scriptures, there's a little more than what just Paul says here. So uh, we'll start in Psalm 14. Psalm 14 and verse 1. Psalm 14, verse 1. It says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and see God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Look over at Psalm 5. So that was Romans 11 and, or, uh, 3, 11, and 12. Romans 5, verse 8. Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. It's interesting here it says they flatter with their tongue. Over in Romans it talks about deceit with the tongue. So this is a malicious flattery, if you will. And the next verse, destroy them, O God. <laughs> Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out into the multitude of their transgressions. For they have rebelled against thee. And that is eventually what's going to happen to everybody that rejects the gospel. Look at Psalm 10. Psalm 10 and verse uh, 1. Verse 2. 
The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puppeth at them. He hath said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. He sitteth in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places does he murder the innocent. Boy, there's an interesting concept, huh? Would a womb be a secret place? Just throwing that out there. <laughs> his eyes are privately set against the poor. He lieth in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lieth in wait to catch the poor. He doth catch the poor when he draweth him into his net. He croucheth and humbleth himself and the, that the poor may fall by his strong ones. He hath said in his heart, God hath forgotten. He hideth his face. He will never see it. Psalm 36. You can see these are not painting a flattering picture of mankind. He does a very, God does a very good job of describing exactly the wicked. And as I, as I read through these things, I go, boy, there's a, you can see that happening in society today, um, big time. Psalm 36, verse 1. The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. For he flattereth himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful. The words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. He hath left off to be wise and to do good. He deviseth mischief upon his bed. He set himself in a way that is not good. He abhorreth not evil. And then the last one is Isaiah 59. We'll start in verse 1. And remember when we started back in Romans 1, Paul makes the argument, people, mankind was not thankful and did not glorify God as God. You'll see that sh issue show up in, in verse 1 here, and we'll read down to about verse 8 or so. Isaiah 59, verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. So a man saying, he's saying, God can't do this stuff, even if there is a God. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue hath muttered perverseness. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. I mean, isn't that what's going on today? Nobody is calling for the truth today. The one thing that is held in contempt above all other things is the truth. Uh, five, they hatch cockatrices' eggs and weave the spider's web. He that eateth of their eggs dieth, and that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. Their webs shall not become garments, neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they know not. There is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. It's amazing that this irrelevant book that's 6,000 years old or whatever it is, written by 40 men, nailed mankind yeah. and just nailed them spot on and boy as I'm reading through these things here this morning I go boy I can see all these issues coming up this 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 lack of truth this lack of judgment this uh, killing of the innocent in our society today and um, look over at Hebrews 4 
So when the, you know, think about how powerful that argument would have been to a Bible-believing Jew at the time. When Paul quoted those things, they would have had the whole passage. I mean, how many, how many passages do you know more than one verse? You know the whole passage where that verse is. When Paul was reading these, I mean, he's, he lists 19 or uh, 14 things there, but he picks up about 40 verses probably, just would have just cut, cut them to the quick. Um, and look at Hebrews 4. There's a reason that Paul, when Paul's trying to make that point to the Jew, he goes right to the Word of God, right to the oracles that were given to the Jew. Paul doesn't use the wisdom of the world to convince the Jew. He goes to what the Jew puts his trust in, uh, rightly so. The Jew, right? I mean, the, the, the I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't say they believed it, but a Bible-believing Jew would have believed the Old Testament. A, they would have been familiar, right? Even the, even the self-righteous would have, all the Pharisees were, were biblical experts. You know, they could have taught the seminary at the local thing. So when he, when, there's a reason Paul does that. Verse, Hebrews 4, verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That's exactly what Paul did. He used that two-edged sword to go to the Jew and say, here's your scriptures, you should know that you are not good. You cannot get justified by your law. Now, the same thing, we can't get justified by the law either. The Word of God's where the power is. It's where the conviction comes from. It's never about our words. It's always about God's Word. God's words found in God's Word. Don't ever think the words, the actual words on the page don't matter. We talked about this on Thursday. Well, you're always better to quote the verse, and you're always better to show the verse. And today, that's very easy. I assume everybody has a Bible on their phone. It's very easy to, to, to show the words because the words matter. Understanding comes from God's Word and, and, and God's Word rightly divided. Sometimes we get intimidated that, well, I can't say it because I, I don't speak really well. Or... I don't have excellent speech or great wisdom. All you need to, to do to speak is to have the Word of God. That's all you need to do. Speak the verses that you know. Show the verses. The Bible will do its job if we will get out of the way. If anything, what, what you should learn in the... Making the assumption everybody here is saved... As, as you, when you go through these first three chapters of Romans, the, the thing that really sticks out to me is that every argument that man can make, Paul addresses, Paul answers. You don't need to come up and come up, find a new answer to an argument. It's already been made. If you're making an argument that's not in the Bible, you probably need to pick a better argument. And you probably need to pick an argument that's out of the Bible. Because the, the argument in the Bible is going to have a lot more weight and a lot more convicting power than any argument you can make. Um, look back at Romans 3. In verse 19. 19 to 20. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God, Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified by his, in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law manifests to those under the law, who is the Jew, that he is a sinner, just like the Gentile. By the end of the verse 19 here, Paul has proven that man has no, defen no defense, no ability to justify his behavior, and that everybody's guilty. The Gentile is not thankful didn't glorify God as God, guilty. A self-righteous moralizer that was so thankful he was not as bad as the guy next to him, guilty. The Jew that had the oracles of God given to him, that had the word of God given to him, was God said, I am your guy. I am the God of Israel, guilty. Everyone is guilty. All the world is guilty. He says in verse 20, you can't be justified by the law because by the law is the knowledge of sin. 
The law manifests sins in your life. Look over at Galatians 3. I think we looked at this last time, but Galatians 3 and verse 22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. You know, if everybody wasn't under sin, the promise couldn't be given by faith to them because then they could have earned it. If, they could, if you could earn it, it wouldn't be given to you by faith. But God has concluded everybody's under sin today. Therefore, the promise is by, is by faith. The law was given to convict all under sin. The law has condemned all men. The law is not the answer to sin. You can't control sin by the law. All you can do is be made aware of sin through the law. It's the knowledge of sin. It is not the control of sin. The Jew, remember, he rested in the law. And that very law showed that he was guilty before the very God that he boasted in. The law showed the Jew that he was guilty before God. That's a pretty easy concept to get. They had the law. The law said, they, okay. But how does the law condemning the Jew prove that all the world's guilty before God? If you, if you go back to Romans 3 and you look at that verse, that's, that's really the point he's making. 319. Now we know that what things over the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. That's the Jew. That every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Well, it does it in two ways. Mankind, and specifically the Gentile, was declared without excuse back in chapter 1, verse 20. Um, so when the Jew, who wasn't given up and had the oracles of God, was shown to be guilty, that would, just, that would conclude everybody because God gave up the Gentiles because they were guilty. And then he comes along and says, okay, now the Jew too, he's guilty. Well, that's everybody. The other side, the other part of that is if a Gentile had become a proselyte, that wouldn't help him out. Proselyte, you know, converted to the Jewish religion. He would convert to the Jewish religion. He was now part of the covenants and the law, but that didn't help him because the very law and covenants he was put in his rest and showed that he was still a sinner. All the world. The law shows that all the world is guilty. Admitting guilt is the first step in a person's salvation. It's been on, truthfully said, nobody ever got saved from hell without knowing they had to go to hell first. And that, that's what this book will do. It will convict. When your mouth is stopped, when you quit excusing yourself, when you quit justifying yourself, when you quit rationalizing your behavior, when you admit your guilt, you've taken that first step, if you will, to, sal to salvation. You get saved by putting your faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross as payment for your sins. If you continue to justify your actions, if you continue to say that you're not that bad, I'm not as guilty, I'm not that guilty, then you have not admitted that the shed blood of Jesus Christ is enough. You've said, well, it's his blood, plus my not being that bad. Because I meant good. But it's not, it's no. It, it, it's, you, you have to come to that point where your mouth is stopped. Now, that's, the world doesn't like that. God's saying, shut up. <laughs> Put your faith in my son. You cannot justify your actions. We just looked at all those Old Testament scriptures. Let your mouth be stopped. Understand that you're guilty. Read the rest of the chapter because I got some good news to tell you. But right now, Shut up and understand your guilt. And that's exactly where man needs to come to. Look over at uh, uh, Philippians 3. The law will not justify you. Performing the law will not justify you. Rome, uh, Philippians 3 verse 9. Paul talking about these righteousnesses. He says, um, 
verse 8, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. The righteousness which is by the law is a man's righteousness. It's our own righteousness, which Isaiah 64, 6 says is nothing but filthy rags. We looked at that last time. You just throw those filthy rags away. Paul says it's not his own righteousness that's the issue, the righteousness which comes by the law, but the righteousness which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. You can't be justified by the law, not by any work that you do. The law doesn't justify. The law points out sin. And that's why you cannot change behavior expecting to see a change in the inner man. You need to transform your mind or a person's mind, that inner man, to change the behavior. Changing the behavior through an external workspace system, if you will, the only thing that will do is puff a person up. Say, look what I am able to do. I can conquer this. I can deny that. We have a part to play. It's not, this is not this thing where God zaps you. You definitely have a part to play, but you need to rely on the power that is of the Holy Spirit and not the law. This is where I want to spend a little bit of time on today because the point Paul is making here is that, that no one can be justified by the law is in fact the opposite of what a lot of Christianity is teaching today. I've taken, a, in, in, the, in the, the ongoing culture wars, I've taken an interesting look at, at, at what I have seen. And, it, you know, it's a great thing because with the age of the Internet, you, you, see, you can see all the wackos. You can see all the wackos. And you've got to be careful. You've got to understand uh, there's an extreme on both sides. But I, can I tell you, boy, I, Christianity today is not doing themselves uh, a world of, of good. I mean... I understand why the unsaved look at a lot of Christians and think they're a bunch of bozos and idiots because, well, they're a bunch of bozos and a bunch of idiots. <laughs> Today we're hearing, if you do this sin, you're going to hell. If you don't do such and such, you're going to hell. They say loudly, if you're a homosexual, if you're in a gay marriage, you're going to hell. Yet they never mention that that same great TV preacher making millions who has an affair on his wife about going to hell. He's a great man. Little, little issue with the flesh, but he's a great man. The truth is that the wages of sin is death. Every sin, every sin results in death. Many in the church today are teaching a work-based salvation. That you must act a certain way to get to heaven. And dress a certain way to get to heaven. Or you must act a certain way to prove that you are saved. That's not the gospel today. That's not the glorious gospel of Christ. The glorious gospel of Christ is that Lord Jesus Christ came in the world to die for sinners. He came into the world, he loved sinners, and he paid the penalty. The righteousness of God is available to all. What Paul's talking about right here, it's available to everybody, but it's only unto or upon all those that, upon all those that believe. And believe that the redemption is found in, in Jesus Christ. There's, redemption is not found in any work you can do, in any man that speaks from a pulpit. It's not found in any church. It's not found in any dogma. It's not found in any silly guy in Italy right now with a white hat on his head. Redemption is found in the Lord Jesus Christ, and there's no work that can be done for salvation. Again, if you want to change society, you don't do it through the law, through laws, through the law. You do it through changing people. If you want to change society, preach grace and peace. Get people saved, show them who they are in Christ, and then watch that work out in them. Get out of the way, let the Holy Spirit work in them. All the law does is manifest the righteous, unrighteousness of man manifested all are under sin 
all have sinned and all are guilty before God. The response of the unsaved to that knowledge, to that light, though, is the issue. Because more often than not, they justify, defend, rationalize, and get others to partake in that action as well. Romans 1, we've studied. When unrighteousness is pointed out by the Holy Spirit, you have two choices. Now, this is true about the saved and the unsaved, by the way. You can reject the counsel, counsel of the Holy Spirit and go on about your way. If you're unsaved, you're going to spend eternity in the lake of fire. If you're saved and reject the counsel of the Holy Spirit, you're going to suffer loss. But you still go to heaven. But you have two choices. Reject the counsel of the Holy Spirit or accept the counsel of the Holy Spirit. And in the case of the saved, of the unsaved, that choice is going to cause them to repent, to change their mind and say, okay, I've been wrong about this issue. I am going about trusting in my own goodness, and I'm going to trust in the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. You guys all know who Stephen Hawkins is, right? The guy in the wheelchair with ALS, the smartest man alive now that Hitchens is dead. He says that, do you guys know who John Lennox is? Okay, he's a professor of mathematics at the University of Oxford and a very strong Christian, and he goes around and debates, debates all these guys. Okay. So Stephen, I love this line, and I, I was able to find it last night. Stephen Hawkins, the atheist, says, Christians believe in fairy tales because they're scared of the dark. John Lennox has got the greatest rebuttal for that. He says the atheist believes in fairy tales because they're scared of the light. <laughs> and I love that quote. I really appreciate that quote. What and the quote, the quote, yeah, yeah. I mean, John Lennox, I don't know much about him. I just know he, he, he takes these guys to task. Um, and, boy, he's right in the middle of it. I mean, University of Oxford, he's an, he's an intellectual elite. Wow. And, and uh, he, has, he has the bona fides. They can't just write him off as a wacko. Yeah. Uh, but I, I thought that was great. The atheist believes in fairy tales because they're scared of the light, capital L. And, and, and that's, exactly the, that, that's exactly what happens. The, when the gospel is presented to somebody, they have a choice: accept or or reject. The law shows the sinner that he is a sinner and that he needs a savior. He responds positively and gets saved. Negatively, remains in darkness. Um, we saw. We talked about it. Natalie got attacked by the thought police last week, and. You know, the person, that, the, the person that, that sought her out in that was just attempting to ju justify and rationalize her own thoughts and her own beliefs that are at, that are at, at, at odds with God. And, it, it, you know, there was a, a lot of venom came out towards Natalie on that one, which is very interesting. I've told that story several times, and everybody goes, that's not Natalie. <laughs> but uh, if God's a fairy tale, if Christians are delusional, hateful bigots that are so out of touch, why has the world spent so much time attacking us? Like, you should be able to write those people off as wackos, right? Because it's guilt. The world and people individually. Don't, don't forget, when you talk about the world, we're talking the world's made up of individuals. Just like the body of Christ is made up of individual members. The world and people individually know that the acts of unrighteousness are worthy of death, but are unwilling to submit to God's judgment. And they think the louder they yell, the louder they say hate, the more right they are. Just because you're loud doesn't mean you're right. In fact, I told Natalie to do the opposite. Next time, if she gets something, just talk softer and softer and softer. And the softer you talk really pulls the oxygen out of that fire. Meekness, yes. Yeah. As a parent, yes. <laughs> the message of a member of the church, the body of Christ today, the message of an ambassador for Christ today is to declare grace and peace to a lost world, mm -hmm. to lost individuals. Yeah. I got reminded when we were down in Sacramento, Jesus loves the world, oh, but he loves me. Make it personal. There's a judgment. The world's going to hell in a handbasket. The world's made up of individuals. Don't forget, when we talk about the world, it's, it, it becomes very impersonal. We're talking about our neighbors and our coworkers and maybe some, some behavior that's manifested in our own selves even. 
if you could get an unsaved person to quit his sinful behavior, that person would still go to hell. Stopping sin does not save a person. By the works of the flesh, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified. When talking with the unsaved, the issue is that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Jesus Christ loved them. Jesus Christ died for them. And that putting their faith in the shed blood of Lord Jesus Christ, they can go from being dead to alive, from being in Adam to in Christ, from an eternity spent in the lake of fire and hell to an eternity spent in heaven, reigning and ruling with Jesus in the heavenly places as, as joint heirs. Look over at 1 Timothy. It will be awesome. It will totally be awesome. Look at 1 Timothy 1. First Timothy 1, verse, verse 3. Now, we're also going to go to Titus 2. We'll start in First Timothy. First Timothy 1, verse 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some of them that they teach no other doctrine. So this passage we're going to look at is about doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies He's talking about the law, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and out of a good conscience and out of a faith unfeigned, or sincere faith, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for holy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. We're going to come right back here, but look at Titus 2, 1. It says, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Speak the things which become sound doctrine. That speak there is an action, right? Okay, and that action has to do with sound doctrine. Come back to, you can let go of that, but come back to First Timothy. Talk about the, what the law is good for. When you read through this passage, in, in verse 9, the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, the ungodly and sinners. Everything he lists there it reflects a person, not an action. These are actions that people do, but he doesn't say for murder. He says for murderers, for sin. Everything is re about a person. We just saw in Titus that issue of sound doctrine is it has to do with speaking, okay? What I want you to look at is the very last phrase in verse 10. It says, so he's, li he's listed all these people. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Okay, so the law is good for all those people. And it's good if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Well, what's the any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine? It's people teaching the law. Everything else, everything else in that passage is a person. It's somebody that embodies that. He starts out talking about they want, they are desiring to be a teacher of the law. But understanding neither what they say not, nor whereof they affirm. The law, the lawful, the lawful use of the law, is to highlight a person's sin, that a person is sinner is needed of a savior because they are not righteous. Paul lists all those things. The law is also lawful to use against people that are teaching the law. Sound doctrine is that glorious gospel of blessed God. It's Paul's gospel. If someone desires to teach something other than the grace of God specifically in our passage here, desires to teach the law, the law can be and should be used to correct them back to the gospel of the grace of God. 
Well, how do you use the law to get someone to teach grace? That kind of sounds like an oxymoron, right? You use the law the same way Paul does. You take them all the way back to Romans 1.16 and bring them all the way down to Romans 3.20 and point them out that the results of the law are that you are just guilty, that there is no salvation found in the law. That should make somebody, if they have a pure heart, if they have faith unfeigned, it should make somebody understand, okay, the law is not the answer to the sin problem. The law highlights the sin problem. Grace is the answer to the sin problem. The cross is the answer to the sin problem. Paul's gospel shows that all people, everybody in verses 9 and 10 here, can be saved. Continue on in the passage, verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul's gospel shows that all those people can be saved. The proof of that fact is Paul's very salvation. Paul's salvation proves Paul's gospel, if I can put it that way. Paul was the chief of sinners. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. If that's the pattern, and is that the pattern? Yes, it is. That Jesus Christ's death saves sinners as evidenced in Paul, then everyone can be saved if they believe. Salvation is not an issue of being good enough, but in shedding, trusting in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That that's enough to save you. It's not an issue of sacrificing yourself, but in trusting that Lord Jesus Christ was the propitiation, was the fully satisfying sacrifice for your sins. Would Christendom changed its focus from getting the lost saved to changing society, they lost their way and they lost society. God's not your political ally. He's the creative, creator of the universe, dispensing grace and peace, and there's a time of today, and there's a time of judgment coming. I say again, if you want to change society, get people saved and teach them to understand their, their, their identity in Christ, and you will see a change. One of the great, big, huge local evangelistic organizations used to have a great, big, huge concert every year, free concert, but to get to the concert, you'd listen, you had to listen to a gospel presentation. That's what the church has always done, right? The missions, come and get your free meal, gospel presentation. This big organization, the city of Portland said, okay, we want you to keep doing what you're doing, but you, we, no, no more gospel presentation. And they said, okay. It's about pride. Look what we can do. And you, they, you've lost, they, they've lost their way. The church has become a, a political organization for societal change. Now, do I agree with a lot of those things? Sure. Sure, I, I agree with a lot of things that they do, and, and, but, but that's not the church's focus. The church's focus is to get the lost saved and get those that are saved to understand their identity in Christ. Now, the church doesn't even understand that issue right now. It is also popular right now, for, I, I've probably spent too much time on the internet reading, but for Christ, <laughs> yeah, it, it just it makes me angry. And it's not angry at the other side, it's angry at what should be my side, if you will, which is not my side. <laughs> it's popular right now, and this, this, this one kind of hurts, for Christians to say one thing, do another, and then use this explanation, yeah, I know I'm a sinner, but I've been forgiven, so what, it's okay that I sin. But the sin that you do is not okay. And that's true. Yeah, we're all sinners. The bumper sticker, Christians aren't perfect, they're forgiven. Yeah, but that's not an excuse for bad behavior. Essentially, what Christians are doing, they're using the cross as an excuse for bad behavior. And that's not right. It's this, 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 this arrogant attitude that I'm Christian, 
I'm forgiven, and therefore my behavior doesn't really matter. It's, it's like the Pharisee. And you know, the, the Pharisee and the sinner that do the prayer, and the Pharisee says, well, I thank you that I'm not as bad as him. Well, you are. The Christian says, I'm forgiven. My, my behavior doesn't matter. I mean, I'm only human. Of course I sin. You, however, you're unsaved. You're so much worse than me because you're not forgiven. Being forgiven doesn't make you any better than, the, than anybody else. It makes you forgiven. And it makes you with a different destiny. Being saved doesn't make you better than the unsaved. It just makes you saved and with a better destiny and with an understanding. Instead of sharing the gospel of grace with lowliness and meekness, the unsaved are being told they're going to hell unless they change their behavior. Never having the gospel shared with them. The reason I put my post on Facebook was because I read literally hundreds and hundreds of col uh, comments and never once saw a gospel presentation. Not one time. I saw a lot of vitriol on both sides. Not one gospel presentation. And that's what's happening. Can I tell you that you're going to hell too for your actions, except that you're saved, except for what Jesus did on the cross. Use the law to show the saved that the unsaved that they're sinners. Use the gospel of grace of God to show them how they can change their destiny from being in the lake of fire to ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ in the heavenly places. A couple more minutes. Many Christians, like I said, use the cross to excuse their bad behavior, to justify their bad behavior. Paul never does that. Paul never uses the cross as an excuse for bad behavior. In fact, he uses the cross as a reason for good behavior. He doesn't look the other way when he sees poor living. He doesn't say it's okay because you've been forgiven. He says Jesus Christ died on the cross so you don't have to live that way. And you should not live that way. Look, I want to look at a couple of these. Look at Romans 12. Romans 12, verse 2. Now, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. By the mercies of God, live like who you are in Christ. Look at Galatians 1, verse 4. Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Jesus Christ died for us that he might deliver us from this present evil world. That present evil world is not a reference to the rapture. That's a, that's a reference to proper living, if you will. Now, he does it, but he died for us. Therefore, we should present our bodies a living sacrifice. Uh, Galatians 6. This is a good one. <laughs> it's a very good one. Verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have there op for opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. It does say all men especially to those that are faith. But it doesn't say you don't have to be good to the unsaved. Look at Ephesians 2. Verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that of, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in. In them. Go over to Ephesians 5. Verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love 
as Christ also, also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all cleanness or, or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that nor whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. You're a child of light. Don't use that as an excuse to live as a child of darkness. Live as who you are, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Titus 2. Verse 14. Who gave himself for us? Why did Jesus Christ give himself for us? That he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Chapter 3, verse 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. That's who we used to be. Don't do that anymore. But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, there's the cross, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto all unto men and then it goes on to talk about the law don't use the cross as a justification for bad behavior don't use your Christianity your um, your savedness your, 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 your yeah. yeah your saved status your, your status as a child of, of light to attack other people I mean he says this is who you used to be um Uh, we used to be foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. That's the battle going on today right there. Titus 3.3 3 is, is, is the battle going on right now today. But we're acting like the enemy. And I don't mean that necessarily specifically, but, but the, the, the culture wars today, the culture wars are being won by the other side because the Christians aren't really showing up real well. They're not, they're not showing up at, according to the gospel of grace. It's like I said... Christianity looks out and thinks the gospel is only for the unsaved. No, the gospel is for everybody. Once you're saved, you still need the gospel. It tells you how to live. The very passage we're in, it's the great grace of God that brings us salvation, teaches us. The very thing that saved us is what teaches us. That's my soapbox. I'm like, I'm upset. <laughs> and I got to stay off the internet. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I can read the, the articles are fine. It's the comments that are driving me up a wall and uh, the lack of uh, understanding and the lack of depth and the lack of love, the lack of charity. And improper judgment. I mean, I don't have a problem calling behavior bad. I mean... I expect I expect my wife to call my behavior bad and, 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 and for me to call my kids' behavior bad. And, and, and I don't have a problem with the calling the behavior bad, but to say, I'm better than you, or that's going to send you to hell. Well, yeah, all our behavior is going to send us to hell. We just, we're saved. Thank goodness we responded positively to the gospel by the grace of God. Share that. Be an ambassador. Proclaim grace and peace. 
don't don't declare judgment and wrath because there's a fundamental misunderstanding that that God is this is a time of judgment and wrath from God today. It is not. I wish I had the chart up. It is a time of grace and peace. It's the very first thing Paul says in every epistle he writes. It's not the gospel. It, Paul's gospel is not the, the gospel of the judgment of God. It's not the gospel of the law of God. It's the gospel of the grace of God. I said it. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come together and that we can study your word. We thank you, Lord, that we do live in a time of grace and peace. And my prayer for all of us, myself included, Lord, that we would, that we would live a life in accord with the gospel of grace, Lord, that we would not grieve the Holy Spirit, that we would work with the Spirit, allow the Holy Spirit to transform us, and that we would put on display the life of Christ, and that to a lost world we would proclaim, proclaim grace and peace, Lord, and that we would see the unsaved saved and the saved be brought on to maturity, Lord, and whatever part we can play in that, I pray that we will speak boldly when given the opportunity, Lord. We know all this is possible only because your son came, died on the cross in the form of a humble servant, Lord, and died on the cross for our sins. It was a fully satisfying sacrifice for our sins, Lord, through your grace. And we praise you for that in your name. Amen.